Hi, welcome to another edition of the Opposing Points podcast. I'd like to welcome Frank McCormick, founder of Chalkboard Heresy. Frank, how are you? Thanks for joining. Good. Thanks for having me. It's great to be on. Awesome. Um, so I just want to start out with uh, a little bit about yourself and, and why you've chosen uh, to, speak up, to speak up. Sure. So, um, you know, as, as people probably know, I'm a, I'm a teacher. Um, and over the summer, I kind of reached a, a breaking point with what was going on. I felt nationally in education, some of what I'd witnessed in my own schools. And I just decided, you know, hey, I'm going to start speaking out. I'm going to get on Twitter, make a blog, kind of um, create kind of a, a message and, and try and stick to that and just start speaking freely. Because I felt that, you know, for years, I uh, hadn't been able to speak freely, that I always had to censor myself, worry about, you know, what I posted. I, I felt like, you know, if you were liberal or on the left and a teacher, you could get out there and put out your political opinions and never have to worry. And I felt for myself, I had to be very conscious of that, you know, who can see my posts and who knows how I feel about these issues. And I'd had a few experiences where people had, you know, an administrator, you know, you got to think about what you post and the community's politics here. And I had gotten one time a per I engaged with, you know, a, a friend of a friend and they reported me and said, you know, he doesn't support Black Lives Matter. And he said that they're, you know, rioting and looting's bad. And so, and, you know, I, I was always kind of worried about that. And I think uh, I got to this point where I was just tired of it. And, and also reached a point as a teacher where I felt, you know, kind of burnt out, beat down by the system. And I was like, you know what, there's just, this is just too much. And there's a cost to being silent. And I just didn't want to do the game anymore. I didn't want to just go along for the next 25 years and collect a paycheck and go into work and, you know, feel like mm -hmm. I wasn't being authentic to myself. So I said, you know what, this, this may get me fired, but I'm just, let's just go because, you know, enough's enough. Yeah, it's it's definitely a scary thought because it's, it's it's your it's your livelihood that could be at risk just simply for believing something which never like probably since what the Red Scare when everyone was accused of being a communist um, did 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 people really have to fear being fired for for their political beliefs in the United States? Yeah, it, it is weird to think you know that you can be like fired for, for having the wrong opinion and then blacklisted in education, you know, from ever working in it again, they, um, even when you, you know, for a while I thought because my, my school district, there's a lot of dysfunction. There's a lot of toxicity there. It's a, uh, it's a large urban bureaucratic mess. And, you know, I thought maybe you know, I'm not happy. Maybe I'll apply to some other schools and, you know, I'm getting through these questions and they're ideological screening questions. And I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and, and at some point they're going to find out, like, you can't keep that part of you a secret. And, and I don't believe there's anything wrong with having differing viewpoints. You know, it's not like I'm getting, you know, despite what people say, I'm not getting out there and saying, you know, racist comments or that I support white nationalism. I've argued against those things, but mm -hmm they're going to frame it however they want. And so I'm, you know, I decided when I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this. So I might as well go big or be quiet. And so I decided to just kind of, you know, here's who I am. Here's what I'm saying. Um, if you're going to call me out, I'm going to just say like, yeah, go ahead and, and, you know, bite back a little because there aren't many teachers doing that. And, and I know sometimes you do get teachers that, will do it, but they kind of, they do it quietly and they do it so diplomatically. I felt like I was thinking about this last night. I was like, why did I decide to like go, you know, so full out so big. And I think part of the reason was I said, I want to show other teachers, like, I want to take it to the edge, you know, make a point out of it. If I can do it, if I can do this, maybe they can say, Oh my gosh, he really went out there. Maybe I can speak up a little. And, um, you know, so I, I, I kind of created like a symbol and a brand too, because I wanted, I said, look, even if I get fired, I want it to be, to mean something. 
to be symbolic to people be like, you know what, I'm a heretic too, but I'm going to embrace it. And um, yeah, I, I had a very different approach. And I, I think, you know, some people, not everyone agrees with it. Some people think like, hey, you should have come in there quiet and mellow and this and that. And I'm like, yeah, well, that, that's kind of who I am too. You know, I'm, I'm a kind of a big personality and I just just felt that uh, I wanted to do it my way and, um, you know, to test the limits a little. You know, I think sometimes it, it's kind of an act of protest too. Sometimes when you do acts of protest, you're, you're purposefully pushing and, um, you know, keeping people on, 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 on their edge and feet. And it's kind of in, in a way worked because my district, I don't think they know what to do. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, they're used to kind of the, someone does it quietly and they can pull them in and they can scare them or they can get them to resign because of a comment. And I, I don't think they were expecting me to just like go full out. And, and when I got threats or something, go on video and be like, yeah, I, I heard, you know, this is going around and come on, let's bring it on. And so I think I'm sure that there it's been discussed, but you know, behind the scenes and how do we do this? And they've probably thought about like constructive termination options, but um, mm -hmm. You know, at this point, I'm just not afraid anymore. Yeah, I, I want to go back to something you said regarding um, white supremacy. So I think oh, it's sure. I think it's really important um, to distinguish, like, you know, I, I think of of supporters of, for example, the former president, uh, people lumped everyone into being a white supremacist. Yes. And I'm sure there are a few white supremacists or, or I'm not sure the exact number that that do support him, just like there are probably a quite a few white supremacists that are against teaching of, of, or the pedagogy, which we can go into of critical race theory in schools. Um, but I think the, the key difference I would attribute is to that they are, and they, they kind of say like, it's, it's, an, it's anti-white, like we, they call it, even in the, in the liberal media, they call it a white lash, like what happened here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you distinguish of, uh, can you distinguish that for viewers in terms of um, how, how you view it uh, versus saying it's just solely a white lash. Because I think that's where people will try to corner you into. Yeah, I mean, you get kind of put in this, it's hard because you, they kind of put you in this category, which, which I'm not, yeah, I belong, I am white, you know, and they make it kind of the center of your identity. And they tell you that, everything you do and what you say and how you think is characteristic of white people. And they, ex I don't, I don't know what they, what they think is going to happen, but you know, one of the things I've kind of expressed concern about is that you're going to kind of promote these white identitarian movements because people are going to say, well, yeah, I am white. And uh, I guess, you know, I do have to look after my interests and it's kind of an unintended consequence it, you know, is it white lash? I mean, look, there are, I mean, a lot of the response has been, you know, from white people, but I, I also don't know what they expected when you go in there and, and you teach things like, you know, white people are inherently privileged and they are inherently racist and white culture is inherently bad and toxic, you know, you're going to get some, you're going to get some defense and response from that, particularly from white people. I mean, it's just, it shouldn't be surprising. And, you know, I've, I've said, I occasionally I get, you know, comments, you know, on Twitter and someone will say, well, you need, you know, you should be thinking about your race and about white people. And this, I'm like, I'm not, that's not what I'm interested in. I don't care. I, I have no desire to collectively, you know, identify with, even though it's, it's, it is kind of the dominant, you know, culture. I recognize that it's not important to me. Ideas are more important. Um, I was talking to a colleague about this and I, you know, they were talking about the importance of representation and why Republicans don't have more diverse voices. And I said, well, who would you, who would you vote for if you had a choice? Would you vote for a diverse quote unquote, diverse Republican, a black Republican or a white liberal. Like, well, I wouldn't like either. I'm like, well, that's not an answer. Like, mm -hmm. and I think I, I think I know you, what you would choose. You would choose the person based on the idea. So just be honest. Yeah. And if you would choose the, if you would choose the black Republican, then that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother kind of issue right there, because that's, that means you're, you're placing people's racial identity above ideas. And, and that to me is a really weird thing to value above ideas because it really tells you very little if, you know, 
someone being black or white doesn't tell me, it may tell me about certain like cultural backgrounds they have and maybe cultural norms and so forth, but it doesn't tell me what they believe. And so I'm going with what people believe and think 10 times out of 10. I mean, you know, if, if someone is with me in terms of values and, and the same ideas and arguments, I don't care what they look like. And mm -hmm. I know that's become kind of like, you're not supposed to say that it's considered this like ignorant statement to say that yep. I don't, I don't want to uh, see people based on their, their race. And it's not, I'm not saying I don't see that. I'm just saying that it's, it's like one of the lowest things on my, you know, radar in terms of what I care about. It's, it's, it's probably one of the least significant things. Um, so yeah, I, it, it's just hard. Like, I don't know how, I don't know what, you know, when they say it's white lash, it's just like, it's, it's one of those comments. It's like, okay, I, you know, I, I don't know what, sometimes I just don't know what they mean. I think they're just trying to kind of stoke this, this fear, um, that white people are kind of this collective movement that's working against the interests of black people. I, I just, I, I don't see that. Yeah. You know, from, from what I've gathered, what, what, what you stand for, and you can correct me if I'm wrong is uplifting all children, regardless of race, not teaching one that, Hey, you're given um, these 20 barriers and this is why you'll never be successful. Um, you're, you're, you're kind of into teaching history teaching everything accurately and saying, you can do what you put your mind to if you work hard enough. Right. It's, um, you know, I wouldn't have gone into the district I went into and I wouldn't have stayed there if I, if I didn't believe that. Um, it doesn't mean there, are, there aren't unique challenges in, in the community where I teach, but I, I do, you know, I've seen so many kids with great potential and I've supported them in that. And I don't want to, to put that, that's a heavy burden to carry as a, and, and, there may be I, sometimes the problem with these arguments is there's like kernels of truth to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've certainly felt that way sometimes like, man, you know, what would it like to be like, you know, black in a poor neighborhood? And, and I can see there's some challenges there and how people may judge you, but it's not always exclusively by race. I think sometimes I have an issue with the generalizations. You know, right. my wife is from a very impoverished rural white community. And when she came here with me, she dealt with classism because I live in a more upper scale area of the North Shore. Mm -hmm. And so people would, you know, say things to her like, oh, are you are you going to college or did you go to college? Or, you know, do do you work at this job? Like, is this a side hobby for you? Or like, no, this is my like I work, you know, and I, you know, this is what I do. And so um I get that, but what a terrible thing to tell kids, you know, that they're going to be at inherent disadvantage, even if they're going to face challenges. What does that do? It defeats you, it makes you feel like you have no power over your own life. And it makes you resentful too. When you start, where I really get frustrated is when they start placing the blame on, on collective groups, because then what you're doing is you're taking the defeat and the, the depression that comes from that. And you are kind of directing that towards a group and as we've learned throughout history that's just a really terrible bad thing to do i mean i look at you know i know you know we're going to godwin's law with the you know germans but i'm i am a history teacher and i spent a lot of time studying kind of um pre-war germany and you know did the germans have like a lot of legitimate complaints and a lot of difficulties and were they you know in some ways did they get kind of a raw deal from the other european powers sure but they turned some of those legitimacies into this racial anger against certain groups that they felt were oppressing them. I mean, we, we look now and we're like, yeah, Jews were the minority, but they had a lot of influence and power in the, in the Weimar Republic um, and positions of government and in culture. And, and they weren't seen as that. They were seen as like the kind of elite oppressive group. Um, and, and so it worries me. Um, Mm -hmm. I, 2020, I mean, not everyone, but there were enough people out there that were uh, engaged in acts of violence and vandalism and arson. And I do believe that many of those young people had been taught or learned that someone is to blame for their problems. And that made it a whole lot easier, I think, to 
burn down someone's business because then it's not it's not an individual that has a family and that you may get along with. It's a it's a rich white person. It's a you know an enemy class, and mm-hmm. they they deserve it. Well, what's what's funny is uh, um, someone that was arrested in one of those things was from the town I'm from, which is one of the wealthiest <laughs> per per capita. <laughs> She's in, you know, pri- going to private school. Uh, <laughs> and uh, th- these are the people, I, you know, there were, there were a bunch of videos that I, I saw of, of, of during those, during the, the protests, BLM, where, where, um, where, where black people were stopping white people with skateboards from crashing, you know, everyone was participating and they were, and they were, they were, you know, they were peaceful parts of that protest that involved largely black people, right? Mm-hmm. But you had these, you had, you know, people, people stoking flames from, you know, it, it didn't have to necessarily be a black person. I, I think maybe, maybe that's where the narrative was a little twisted. Like I, I've seen these on the ground videos where it's just people taking advantage of mayhem mm-hmm. um, and, and distracting from the actual cause that people are, are marching for. Right? It is interesting, you know, because even historically, a lot of populist radicalism begins with kind of the intellectual classes. Mm-hmm. And is kind of stoked by the intellectual classes and ends up kind of catching up, you know, catching on amongst the kind of larger population. I mean, you look at the Russian Revolution and the French Revolution, a lot of, you know, the radicals were well to do intellectuals that kind of created this movement and, and, and helped to kind of stoke populist flames um and and directing that kind of populist anger and energy uh, towards their end goals Mm -hmm. um it wasn't you know oftentimes you know yes it's almost like the population the the disparate mass has become kind of a a bludgeon for them to use and i've i've definitely seen that you know a lot of the most radical people leading this movement are you know educated middle to upper middle class white kids Mm -hmm. or or young white people or college professors and uh yeah Uh, one uh one one of the things i I was really interested in um was uh your your name chalkboard heresy um for for students taught whole language they might read it as hearsay um but it (laughs) it is heresy um (laughs) so um i i i was religious for 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 some period uh of time of my life um so i'm curious about you know in 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 your posts you talk about priests and crisis of faith i'm curious about what makes it uh a religion uh in in your view um because when i think about religion we talk about like original sin and mm-hmm. stuff like that um and i think at some point it, it becomes an, a, a religion from an ideology right like you can be a religiously fanatic libertarian or right. liberal so, so to, to you like what what makes you kind of take that that jump i i think for a while i had felt kind of like i was in a like i'm in a cult and i felt that the responses I was getting, whether it was from other teachers or friends or family, weren't from a place of reason. The the closest parallel I could draw was like, gosh, this is like arguing with religious zealots. Um, and, and I'm not, it's funny because I'm not making a statement on religion itself. I, I you know, don't really have too many opinions on that. It's more to draw a parallel. Um, you know, I think it's an orthodoxy. I think this kind of uh, whatever you want to call it, critical social justice. I use the term, you know, wokedom, the woke church. I kind of try to stick to a a metaphor and language I think helps people understand it. It fits a lot of the components of what constitutes a religion with the exception of uh, supernaturalism. But, um, you know, who knows, that may not be far behind. I, I kind of joke, you know, I mean, we saw in you know, at some of these protests, 2020, the washing of feet where you had white people washing mm-hmm. feet, black people. I'm like, gosh, you know, it's, it's not stretched before, you know, someone starts claiming like spiritual visions and you, know, <laughs> you never know. Um, I, I kind of feel like in this religion, you know, I spoke about kind of the, the intellectual classes, educators are kind of like priests. They transmit the holy knowledge um, that where this comes from is it comes from kind of the educated classes, the, uh, you know, where it originated with postmodernism and kind of neo-Marxism and it's kind of become this, you know, unique thing of its own critical social justice. Um, 
And I think, especially in that movement, teachers are kind of viewed as kind of these missionary priests who have to transmit that knowledge and, you know, tend to the oppressed flock. Um, you have sins like, you know, whiteness and racism. They talk in language of America's original sin. You have a component of salvation, uh, confessions of racism or collective guilt, you know, and to, you know, become saved from that that sin, you know, they have ways of that. Um, Anti-racism training, you have, you know, these, you know, to use the metaphor, holy texts, uh, white fragility and how to be an anti-racist are kind of now read as like these gospels that are just, they're just true. Um, belief in sacred things and acts, you have kind of the formation of, of sacred groups. A lot of times you, the way they speak of the indigenous people is like with this holy reverence and the LGBT community kind of becomes, uh, and, and Black people kind of become sacred just by virtue of being a minority group. Um, you have elements of martyrdom to it, um, where when you have these kind of viral incidents and, and you know, even when you, you were like, wow, that, that, you know, what happened wasn't right and that was wrong, they become kind of um, seized upon as opportunities to create a martyr for their message and movement. Uh, and, you know, we saw that with George Floyd, um, he, he became a martyr for, for their cause. It wasn't just about him. It was about what this says and what this means and, and how we can use it. And, um, you know, you, you even see kind of these ways of quote unquote worship evolve, you know, the raised fist as kind of a symbol, um, kneeling, um, you know, and I, I kind of said like, you know, the places of worship to them are, are kind of like schools and higher education. I, I think that's why, you know, I, I said, you know, it's, what I'm doing is kind of her heretical and I, I'm a heretic. It's heresy because um, in some ways that's, that's what it feels like when you speak out against this in schools, the reaction you get as a teacher is like, you're not just, a, you know, you're, that, that's heresy. How could you say that? You know, you're going to get discussed. And, uh, and I think schools, because of how they view them as kind of these institutions of social salvation and teachers kind of as these missionary priests, they kind of work to protect that sacred element by getting rid of people that are heretics or that become apostates or, you know, what have you. So for me, you know, kind of creating that name was kind of a way to send a message and to also kind of embrace it too. You know, I'm like spent a lot of time, you know, the past few years trying to convince other teachers, Hey, I'm not actually a bad guy. Hey, you know, we, we can. And then I just said, you know what? Fine. I'm a heretic. I'll embrace it. You know, if I'm going to burn, oh, so be it. Yeah. I, I think something you said about kernels of truth um, mm -hmm. is, is a really important point um, because I think going back to, 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 to the, to the movement, I think people were really on board with, Hey, this, this, this stuff can't happen with the, with the, with the nine minutes on, 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 you know, the back of the neck. And there, there, there have been cases uh, where uh, parallel cases where, where these things were done to, um, to, to people that were not black, maybe white, mm -hmm. Hispanic, where they were, you know, shot and killed while they were sleeping, um, kneeled on the back of their neck. Um, there's, there was a, a famous, uh, case, uh, or famous to me, I don't know if, if it was on the mainstream news, news, but where, where in a hotel, this, this guy had a, a BB gun and the police officer made him crawl to him. Yes. I saw that. Yep. And, and, and to, to whoever's credit in that movement, that's calling it out, like, Bravo, I, I agree. These things shouldn't happen. Um, but but when it, when we start to break it into the identity politics of of it's it's white police is this and that, when you can just look at it as maybe there is a policing issue mm -hmm. with escalation of force, militarization, um, a drug war that arguably has caused more harm than good. Um, I, I think that's where you where you where you win people, and they had people they had people on their side. Right. Yeah. When I saw, I saw that video and I think people should see it. I mean, that, that video to me, what was, was worse than the George Floyd video. That was someone crawling on their knees and gunned down. 
begging they're, for they're their life. Begging yeah. for their life. I mean, and 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 I I thought to myself, I said, if this person had been, you know, black, it I, I cannot imagine the type of response. Uh, we're not talking about like, you know, a, a, as bad as, you know, the, the knee thing was. And, you know, there was at least like some sliver where someone could say, well, maybe he didn't, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not saying I agree with that. I, I just don't know what to think. But there was like at least this like, well, you know, is it a legitimate restraining tactic? And they discussed that in court. But this was like, this was just crazy. I mean, this was a guy crawling on his knees, begging for his life and then gunned down with like, you know, uh, a rifle and um it, what it goes to show is that it's like they don't they don't really care about the issues they say they do they care about how they can use them um they couldn't use that to advance their narrative to advance their kind of political cause it's right. it's terribly cynical and it, it's it's really evil when you get to it I, i'm not saying they're evil but i'm saying a lot of their their actions and behavior just reek of this mm -hmm. uh, because I, I think it's I think it's pretty easy to demonstrate uh, like if, if you're if you're trying to demonstrate uh, police brutality and, and systematic and, and oppression by police, you would show all the instances of it. Right. Like this yeah, is correct. happening to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it needs to be stopped. Maybe maybe it is happening more to uh, to African-Americans. Uh, but regardless, this is a problem and we can all unite around it. Um, but the the, the identity, the identity politics of it all. Uh, is 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 kind of twisting people against them when what they stood for originally is not necessarily a bad thing right oh yeah exactly and, and there's no room for nuance or discussion facts you know uh, a lot of people aren't aware about the you know statistics on unarmed police shootings and there's some uncomfortable conversations in there you know i've had students say well you know, I say, how many, how many unarmed police shootings of black people do you think there are in a day? And then the, some of them will say, you know, dozens, or I've, I've heard hundreds from high school students. Mm -hmm. And I, and I have to tell them, you know, there's 13 in a year. And it's not saying, it's not saying that like, well, that's right. But it's also not saying, you know, there, there are times when you do have to use deadly force against unarmed people, because being unarmed doesn't necessarily mean mm -hmm. you, you won't either become armed, because, you know, you do not want to be in a in a struggle when you have a gun with a person who could potentially have the upper hand because then they have a gun. So there's a lot of nuance. I think it's because this narrative is really overblown and we don't talk about things, you know, um, crime does matter in terms of you have to sometimes adjust um, the police interactions oftentimes are a function of kind of like a crime rate in a certain area. So you can go into a certain area, you could look at like an Asian community and a black community and you could say, well, why are there, you know, there's so many more of, of these issues. Well, if there's no real crime problems in the Asian community, what you're going to have is you're going to have less police interaction with civilians. And when you have less police interaction, you have less opportunities for these issues to arise because that's when they happen. And even when you have, you know, if you have a community where there's, you know, drugs and there's other types of crimes the police are trying to deal with, you have more incidents that occur where there's interactions between police and people. And in every one of those interactions, there's an opportunity for something to go wrong. So it's, it's unfair to just kind of look at it and just say, well, yeah, police are just targeting these people, you know, targeting black people for no reason. A lot of times if you go into these neighborhoods um, and, and innocent people do get caught in the crosshair, that's the tragic thing. But if there's a significantly higher crime rate and they have to deal with that, it's just, it's a mess. The issue of police interaction, especially when you talk about like in minority communities where there's high crime, it's kind of an unfortunate reality sometimes that when you have poverty and crime, you know, we send police in to deal with it. And that gives more opportunities for these interactions to occur. And sometimes they go very poorly. It doesn't justify them. It's just sometimes it just happens. And so I've always felt that if you want to address that, the issue isn't necessarily pulling police out of there. And, and I've read a lot of mixed things about, you know, do these anti-bias trainings even work with police? And sometimes they've been proven ineffective. Sometimes, the, you know, there've been studies that haven't even, you know, have found that bias, you know, that there's even hesitation among white police officers to shoot black suspects. And um, 
So I, th I think what we have to really focus on is the underlying cause. If we can find ways to alleviate economic conditions and reduce crime in some of these areas, you are going to have a less, less of a need for a police presence and you're going to have less interactions. Um, I think it's very complicated and, um, but you know, you can't have those discussions because people want to catch you in a gotcha moment or they want to throw some kind of argument at you that you're not making the oh, well, you're victim blaming. So, like, like what, what, what does that serve? Like, can, like I'm, I'm trying to have a conversation. You've just kind of thrown this argument at me and, and put me on the defensive. And now we're going to be talking about, you know, my morality. Um, and, and you're trying to get me to establish my virtue. I just, I want to talk about issues. I want to be honest and real and I want solutions. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we focus on the tip of the iceberg. You know, we focus on the end point. The end point for a lot of these kind of complex social issues is where the police meet the civilian. But there's all the stuff going on before that is not addressed that could prevent those situations. There was that kid, uh, he was 13 years old in Chicago. I can't remember his name. I don't know if you saw that he was shot. He had, he was running from the police. with a Oh gun. yes. Yes. And he threw the gun away shortly before he threw the gun shortly before he was shot. Yep. And, um, I saw it as, you know, it, it was a tragic situation, but there were all these things before that point. I think he was shooting that, cars, wasn't he? Yeah. I mean, he, he discharged the gun and it's like in that moment, it, it's dark out and he turns around. Yes. He dropped the gun. I, I was just like, Oh, okay. So so what now we, the next time the rule of engagement is to just let him run, to not engage, to let a 13 year old kid with run with a gun. Yeah. Part, part of that conversation should have been like, what, what's going on? Why is there a 13 year old running around with a gun? And how did we get to this point? Yeah. And, um, he probably didn't even know how old he was. No, I no, I, I don't think so. And I'm sure he was so. very distraught. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine, you know, it's just, it, it's again, you sometimes have to, it's funny, the left is so big on like humanizing, like, we need to humanize these moments, humanize, well, sometimes humanizing requires you to look at complexities, and to look at people as, you know, humans, I don't always think they do that, they look at them as kind of, you know, units of a racial group or a, an oppressor class. I mean, is it possible that the cop was like a foaming at the mouth racist? I I guess it's possible. I'm sure you have those. But what's more likely is that he was probably a complex individual who probably had a very rapidly evolving situation, which most of us couldn't handle. And human error is real. I mean, people, you know, it's just the costs are so much higher when you have a gun and you're chasing someone. I think a lot of teachers, you know, we always, as teachers, we always say, oh, I make mistakes all the time. Making mistakes is part of the job. You make mistakes, you do something wrong. Yeah. But if you do something wrong, someone doesn't turn out dead. Right. And, and that's the difference. And they say, well, just train them better. I'm like, okay, look at all the mistakes teachers make. Look at how much training we have. Like sometimes things just happen and um, it's just, just bad. I, I wish, you know, but I don't know what the answer is. It's like, and sometimes bad people do bad things, but sometimes our response is worse. World War One, you know, um, the Serbian nationalist uh, black hand, assassinates Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Okay. Like not a good thing. Not cool. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes that happens though. It wasn't, it wasn't all of Serbia's fault. That didn't mean we had to go to the, into this giant war over it. Um, that's me as a historian. It's not trying to be dismissive. It's just trying to mitigate further damage. I always want to say like, all right, cooler heads guys, like before we go burning down stuff and protesting, let's, you know, so one one of the things that I, I really enjoy about following you on on Twitter is is the materials that that you publish um, that are literally you know demonstrating things through through what you refer to as the the pedagogy right of of mm -hmm. critical race theory and and all over with with the, uh, with the with the young victory it's it's saying oh critical race theory is not taught in schools I don't think that you deny that a class on critical race theory is you know is it's not taught as a as a class right. But right. uh, I think it's helpful for people to understand how it is taught sure. um, uh, through, the, through, the, through that lens. Yeah, it, um, 
it really exists primarily as praxis, which is, you know, the practice of theory. And that's a big part of what critical race theory is. I'm not going to come out and say that, like, I always knew what this was and that I was like, well, of course, that's critical race theory. But I, but I spent a lot of time learning about it before I, I started speaking out. I, I bought all these books on it. And I was like, I, I know this. I recognize this. Like, I knew what it was. I just didn't have a name for it. Oh, so this is where it comes from. So this is what this stuff is called. Because it, and so I think for what it did for a lot of people is it gave, it gave a name to it. And, and you're right. Um, critical race theory is not explicitly taught. You may not even you know, hear it mentioned. But I, I use the analogy of the scientific method of the doctor. It's one of his tools that he uses uh, throughout his practice. Uh, he doesn't say, um, I'm going to be using the scientific method now when I go over your lab reports or investigate this stuff. Um, he just, um, you know, uses it kind of as one of his tools. And um, critical race theory is the same way. It's, it's, a, it's a tool to interrogate race in American society and institutions. And that's where you see it exist is being used kind of as this analytic lens to investigate problems in the school district, how they frame curriculum for students. Um, so they've definitely, um, you know, kind of contorted things and, and misrepresented people's argument by saying that critical race theory is not being taught. I think they know that's dishonest. Um, so yeah, so one of the things that, uh, you know, they're pushing is like, oh, it's not taught, it is taught. Um, it's, it's a white lash, right? But in theory, right, we have, we have the, the theory of evolution, we have the Big Bang theory, would there even, even if they were to like, yeah, we're teaching it, but we're teaching it as a theory, would there be anything inherently wrong with that? I think in the, the age group and the context depends. I think if you were to you know, if it was part of a sociology class or a legal class, you know, sure, but you have to open up to open it up to kind of a, a critical examination and present, you know, both, you know, as teachers, they're kind of, you kind of have to play this role of like a facilitator of conversation and you have to play devil's advocate a lot and challenge students. I mean, that's at least what I do. Even if I agree with something, I'm going to kind of ask students questions to make them justify their argument. So I don't think that's inherently wrong. But I think the problem I have is how it's being implemented kind of as, as praxis, as application, and it is becoming the lens through which problems, like I, you have it on the administrative kind of level where critical race theory manifests as let's look at all the racial disparities in the school, um, automatically uh, reduce it to an issue of racism or oppression and fix it from that angle without even you know, questioning the presuppositions, you then have teachers. And I don't think actually most of them know that like they're, you know, because for a long time, I didn't know the influence critical race theory had. I knew, you know, even when I was younger, maybe, and was hearing certain arguments and like, kind of like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I didn't know where they came from. I just kind of was like, oh yeah, white privilege and white supremacy. And a lot of those originate from critical race theory or have been influenced by it. So teachers, don't even actually really know most of the time where the ideas they're promoting in class and how they're framing things comes from. And so when some of them say, well, I'm not teaching critical race theory, they might, they may not really know um, that that's where it comes from. It's, you know, it's like if you were teaching, um, you could be teaching some racial kind of propaganda that you may not be aware came from Goebbels or Heinrich Himmler or Adolf Hitler. I mean, you just, unless you know the history, but you could still be like spewing it off and promoting it. Mm -hmm. uh, you could be promoting, you know, scientific theories that are just bunk. Uh, so I, I do like, yeah, it, it is not often being explicitly taught and you may not realize it, but I have encouraged teachers like, Hey, here's what it is. Here's the presuppositions it rests on. Um, it exists. And I also think there's, there is one of the problems is there are some people too, that then call everything CRT and, and everything is not CRT. I, I'm almost at the point where I'm just like, I, I think there, there is power in labels and it is important because we know before we lack the language to characterize what we didn't like, like we knew it. So someone say, what's your problem? And you'd go off on this rant, like, uh, you know, I don't like this and that and, and DEI and my kid came home talking about this. I have this problem with this. And they're like, oh, 
so what are you against? Well, now we can just say, you know, critical race theory. That's what I'm against. Mm -hmm. And I think the next part is I really encourage people to, um, which they should, but okay. So you know how to describe it and you know why you don't like it, be able to define critical race theory a little better and, and kind of work on your arguments. Um, I don't think that the arguments are inherently wrong. I just think people yeah. need to become better at making them so that you can fight, um, what it is you don't like. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's important to think about because most people are not necessarily investigating it in the form of long form discussion, like we're having, right. um, you go on whatever, uh, MSNBC, Fox news, and you have, a, you know, a couple minute hit and that information is really useful. Um, but, but to argue based on, on not such a long discussion and to really look into the, the books behind it, you know, long form discussion can really better inform your opinion. Cause I'm, I'm no, like, I, I recognize we all have some sort of emotional reaction when we hear things and right, then we right. use our logic to justify it. So I think we really need to question, you know, why we feel things about this. So like, if, if, if I look back on what I learned in school, I learned about Japanese internment camps. I learned about the, the various exclusionary acts to prevent people from different countries from, from entering like against the Chinese. Um, you learn about slavery, you learn about Jim Crow. So that, that, to my understanding, that stuff is still taught. Is there a, an additional layer to that, that CRT adds that, you know, takes it from beyond learning history and its implications to something more nefarious? Yeah, CRT, I would say when people, whether they realize it or not, are teaching through that lens, it, it frames these historical events probably in a different way. So it's not so much about, um, it becomes kind of a, a broader issue of like white supremacy culture and this group versus that group. And it often ties it into kind of a current narrative. Um, it's, it's very concerned with like bringing it, bringing the past into the present and drawing these parallels. Um, so I don't know, it's obviously, you know, present is influenced by the past. Um, but CRT, for example, may, when it looks at Japanese internment, it may make the argument, well, well this is a classic example of, of white supremacy and then it may ask you know students to um draw a parallel between uh, you know migrant detention today and japanese internment and that to me becomes really ahistorical um, because those parallels often very rarely work for a lot of reasons the historical context is completely different there i mean those people were also legally here right and they were <laughs> legally here and they were actually targeted because of their ethnicity not based on their legal status so you're right there's all these different things but crt oftentimes really provides kind of this nice neat little package to put everything in as part of a larger narrative i mean it's two presuppositions it rests on our american society and institutions are inherently racist and racism is uh, a normal everyday occurrence and so everything has to, you know, build upon and support those foundations. And then CRT is also this practice of interrogating race. So, you know, when sometimes what it looks like is um, it's really simple. A, a teacher that has students do some sort of racial analysis of power between white people and black people uh, in regards to some issue based on the idea that American society is racist. And you're like, oh yeah, that actually that we've seen a lot of teachers doing that stuff. Well, that's CRT. That's kind of both building on its presuppositions and that's the application of it in the classroom. Now people will say, well, what's wrong with that? And, and that's where I really want to get into because it's not just enough to say, well, it's CRT. Why is it wrong? Well, presuppositions need to be challenged and examined. And any kind of theory that just rests on unquestionable presuppositions, I have a problem with. So when they say racism is normal and it's, 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 I, I, I disagree. Like it's actually not socially acceptable at all. There are very few places where you can safely be a racist, um, even like, even like a conservative company, you cannot, for example, I don't care how conservative, like the organization you're working for is. If you walk in there and start using the N-word, you're going to be fired for good reason. Yeah. And so 
like this argument that it's like normative. And so then they have to redefine things. Well, it's like micro racism, microaggressions. I'm like, okay, well, I don't know that that's necessarily is, is racism in all cases. Maybe in some cases it is, maybe in some cases it isn't. And then they say, well, well, racism doesn't even require intention. It's, uh, you know, it just requires disparate outcomes. I'm like, okay, I, I completely disagree with that because racism does require intent. Like, you know, either, you know, you can't, maybe subconscious, maybe conscious, but the idea that just because something plays out differently for two groups of people, that there was automatically some sort of racial bias in there, it's just nonsense. So I'm just like, right now, I'm just getting into these presuppositions, just questions people need to ask. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to bring um, a lens for interrogating race into our classrooms when we can't even have discussions about the presuppositions it's built upon? And when students, like one of the first things, if a teacher is going to talk about white privilege, the, the first question they ask is should be, is there white privilege? And if, if students immediately jump on board and say, yes, 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 you need to challenge them. You need to set up a debate and you need to help equip them to look at, you know, the different arguments for and against it. It, it's really easy, I think, as a teacher to sometimes, you know, students are making your point for you that you naturally agree with and just want to go along with it. But I think the challenge of being a teacher and what you should do, what good teachers try to do, is they try to distance themselves from that and say, hey, you know, sometimes I would even say, since, okay, look, I may agree with you, but I'm, I'm going to present the other side to you. And I may kind of like put them on the spot for 10 minutes. And a lot of times they'd have fun with that. And what about this? What about this? And they'd say, what do you think? I'd say, you know, I, I don't know anymore. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, people ask, people think I have like actually really strong beliefs on these that like I, and some things I do, but sometimes I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I, it's like, kind of like, I'm, I'm thinking about it all the time. I, I don't know what I, what I, what I'm really pushing back against is the, the certainty from which people argue. And when people, sometimes I'm just a contrarian, people make these arguments and they say, well, what do you think should be done? What do you think's the cause? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just like, but I want to have that conversation. I'm just pushing back against your kind of like moral rectitude and, and your absolute certainty about these things. Yeah. Again, I think it goes back to what you said, kernels of truth. Everyone has kernels of truth and no one sure. has the complete information. Right? right. And that's my problem with this, this kind of woke movement is it possesses, you know, as they see it, the truth. They say that we're teaching true history. I mean, who, who speaks in terms of like absolutes of truth? religions do, uh, gravity you know, and absolutely. some philosophies, gravity, <laughs> scientific laws, but these are not, these are not laws of science. These are not mm -hmm. unquestionable and, and they, they should be questioned. Even if you don't like the question, even if something, I mean, every, you know, I, as a teacher, I believe everything should be questioned, even if it is so commonplace that it's like, you know, we, we don't give it a second thought. You should give it a second thought. And, and sometimes you'll be surprised, you know, people just take it for granted that racism is just this normal everyday thing now. And there was even like some recent research that came out that actually found that uh, there's a great uh, article in psychology today. And they, they kind of go through some studies and found like, wow, we, like, it's actually bias. Like, you know, and they were doing these kind of like research studies with like job, like revisiting kind of like job application studies and, and doing like um, blind surveys where they asked people about living, you know, next to a neighbor of a different race. And there was no way to collect the data. And they were like, wow, this actually is you know, they, they saw, you know, four or 5% case of, of bias or discrimination. Now, okay, I'm not saying ideally it should be zero, but four or 5%, that's an aberration. That's not normative. Normative is 60%, 70% when, it, when it's a majority kind of opinion. So like their words, they say racism is normal. No, 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 no. That's actually not normal. If something only happens, you know, one in one time uh, 20, that's, that's not a frequent common occurrence. There's things that happen much more that we wouldn't, you know, consider normal. Um, I probably deal with rude people mm -hmm. more often than that. You know, you might deal with one in 10 people throughout the day who are, are rude. If you're in customer service, that doesn't mean that all people are rude and that rude is the normal standard for a society it just means that some people suck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, yeah, just go, you know, do try to cancel your spectrum service. Right. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll make this argument, you know, with the, if not to go too often a different topic, but people talk about, um, you know, the gender and the trans uh, kind of ideology that goes with that. And they talk about, you know, your sex assigned at birth and they'll say, well, there's, there's variation, you know, some people are born intersex. So, you know, we don't want to say that, you know, sex is binary. And um, I, I looked at like, for example, the statistics of the number of people that are born like intersex and trans, 
And I compare that to the number of people that um, are missing one limb. And the people that are either missing a leg or an arm or multiple is higher. Mm -hmm. I said, so, so, so in your health class, you know, I, was, I was actually talking to a you know, health teacher. I said, do you teach students that not all people, like that um, the, the definition of people uh, having two arms and two legs is, is not scientifically valid? Do you, if someone talks about like, oh, people have two arms, do you go into this like side rant about how actually there's many people with different types of limbs? No, you don't. Because you know there's there's variation, but you kind of know there's a norm too. And it's like the same thing. Like why why is it why is it then with the trans where there's actually less, you get all uptight when someone dares to suggest that there's primarily two genders, mm -hmm. two sex. I mean, you know. So I don't know. I I recommend the uh, the end of gender by Deborah So if you haven't the come end up of gender? Yeah. Oh, I haven't. No, the I'll end of check gender. that out. Uh, yeah, it's great. That and um, Irreversible Damage. And now there's like a bunch of other books on this. I think they're really super, super interesting. Um, give you a good perspective. Um, she, she's like a, a uh, she, she's a former researcher or something like that. Super interesting hmm. um, book. Again, again, it kind of goes back to like where we're, we're, we're so divided um, on almost every issue with each side taking some kernels of truth. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, we, we have a lot of people proposing like, oh, like liberals and conservatives, like let's, let's separate the country. Let's, <laughs> you know, we've, we've, we've done this before, right? Like, how do you, how do you engage with someone who, who is, let's say pro teaching this way, right? How, as you, as, as Frank Cormack, how do, how do you engage with them? How can we do that on a national level? And is this a solvable problem or, or do we need to look to alternative methods like other schools um you know because it, it seems like this is largely a, a public school although you know uh, i think megan kelly's private school in new york was also teaching some of this stuff but how do you solve such a stark divide in values right well yeah it's funny i, I just had this conversation yesterday and someone said to me you know i said frank you know like chalkboard here so you're not going to reach people in the middle and i said you know what or, or the left, or you're not going to reach liberals. I said, I, I spent a decade trying that as a teacher. And I said, you know where it got me? I was, I was still the bad guy. They actually had even less respect for me. The more I argued, the more they, you know, hated me and thought just like, oh, how repugnant I was, uh, no matter how much I tried to, you know, say, hey, I agree with that kernel of truth. Have you, it just, it didn't get anywhere. So I said to myself, okay, before we can even get to that point, What's the problem? The problem is that people that disagree, and maybe they're conservatives, maybe they're disaffected liberals, whatever, they're not, they're too afraid to speak out. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get the message to these people to wake up and pay attention to what's happening in your schools before we can even begin to engage the other side because they don't respect us. Mm -hmm. They don't fear us in any regard we fear them we fear losing our jobs we fear being canceled that we don't stand up to them and in some ways they only kind of like and maybe it's just people in general when you see a kind of a group of people starting to stand up you're like okay maybe i have to re-engage and change my approach right so my argument was okay well i'm going to get my message out to the people that are, are susceptible to it first we get together, we make education kind of the primary focus, and maybe it's mostly conservatives. Okay. We stand together on this issue. We're not going to be canceled anymore. Teachers are going to get together, you know, whether they're libertarian, conservative, or disaffected liberals, and we're going to stand together and support each other. We're going to speak a little more loudly, a little more freely. And then the other side might say, okay, we can't just cancel and fire all of them. And they're pushing back. Mm -hmm. So maybe we do need to engage. And then you can have that conversation. But the way it's been has been basically like, you know, one little quiet mouse kind of like raises their hand and boom, they smash them out. And so um, we need to kind of come together, the mice and, you know, form a cat and say, all right, you know, like sit at the table with us. We're going to talk. We're going to tell you that some things are unacceptable mm -hmm. and we can negotiate because that's what negotiation is. There, there's an exchange of, of, of power and, um, to come to that table, there has to be some of that. And then we can have conversations and we can decide it. And if that doesn't work, 
you know, I, I've also said, well, public education just may have to be abolished. And we may have to go towards like a universal voucher system where people get to choose their own schools because it's really unfair if you don't like what you're, you have, you know, I, I disagree when people say, you don't have a right over to what your kids learn. Well, you absolutely do. You do have a right of what you want to teach and transmit to your children. It doesn't mean you own your children, but part of being a parent is you you get to make that decision. And um, within reason, obviously, you know, there are, there are cases where we can say like, you know, you have to respect certain rights that all human beings have, and you can't violate those on your children. But no one can, if you want to raise your child as a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, that's your right. And so when schools kind of tell you, well, actually, we're going to raise them this way, I, I think that creates huge cultural tension. And is, is it a fight worth having? I mean, obviously, they think it is because they can kind of, you know, influence the future of the electorate and the country through controlling children. But right. um, I think, you know, giving people a choice takes a lot of that away. And then we have to learn, we have to relearn how to become a tolerant society. I'm not just talking about like racial tolerance. I'm saying tolerance to certain ideas, even if we don't like them. Um, it's one of the reason I don't, when like teachers, like in my district have said something, you know, people are like, say their names. I'm like, no, I'm not going to say their names. Um, I don't like, I don't call for people, you know, sometimes I'll highlight someone like, like, look what this person said. I don't tag their employer. I don't call for people to get them fired. We can debate, we can exchange ideas, but we have to become tolerant of that. I think I, I used to have this kind of, I think, naive libertarian argument that's like, well, you know, private companies can do whatever they want and blah, blah. And okay, I still do kind of believe that. But at the same time, we're going to have a problem on the legal end of things with the legal protection of free speech if we have a culture that doesn't respect or tolerate. You know, the law is kind of an extension of society and culture. So this idea that we're going to have like, Oh yeah, free speech will be legal. We'll just like in every other aspects of our lives, you know, stamp it out. Well, guess what's going to happen, guys? Eventually, you know, that's going to influence people to change it through the law. So I think it's really important we have to change that culture. And I get the argument that like, you know, if you go out on a racist rant and you're working for a company, you represent them. But I think there has to be a little bravery too when things are not so clear. And there's many, you know, most of these instances of people being canceled and fired are not for like these extremely obscene behaviors. 99% of the times they're things like, oh, I, can, I can see what they're saying. Oh, that's controversial. Uh, maybe it's a spicy take, but I think like people can handle that. Mm -hmm. like, and, and I don't need, like if I'm like shopping at a, at a store I don't need like the people there to like agree with me on things or I don't, if I'm hiring a company, I mean, I've, I've done business with different, you know, it's like with like Ben and Jerry's, like I disagree with their politics and like, don't buy their ice cream anymore. I'm like, okay. Like they, they can have a difference of opinion and, and, and I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I'm sure there's an argument to be made, you know, about where they put their money and so forth. And I get that, but just, just being okay with that and, and not feeling like everyone needs to think like you. And yeah, it's, it's, it's really a, it's a bigger underlying social problem. And um, mm -hmm. you, yeah, I'm sorry. You, you, you go ahead. I, I wanted to just touch back briefly on something where you mentioned universal uh, vouchers. And one of the things that I've been curious about is right. We have this system of public schooling where you, you go to a school that's in your neighborhood, right? Or, or, or close to it, unless you mm -hmm. choose to go to a private school. So if you grew up in a wealthy neighborhood, typically the school is funded with, with a property tax, right? right. That will then um, pay for the school, pay the teachers, high paying districts will get better quality teachers most likely. Um, so how, 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 how would you decouple or would you decouple uh, school funding from property taxes um, or like, you know, how would that voucher system work? Because I, I, I agree to some extent that, or maybe even total extent that we should have, well, firstly, I think we should have more options than just a monopoly on public schools. But secondly, I do, I do agree that funding, if we're going to fund it, should follow the child. Um, so how do you, what's your kind of vision for how that works that maybe would optimize the school schooling system? I'd say you'd probably ideally want to have some type of uh, statewide consumption tax that funded vouchers. I think property taxes are 
very regressive. And I have, a, I have a real problem with property taxes, this idea almost that like, you never really own your property. You That's how I know you're a libertarian or were a libertarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm still, I still definitely have a, a very strong libertarian yeah. strand in me. Um, <laughs> I, I really have a problem with that. And I think, and I think it's incredibly regressive. And I think it punishes some of the most vulnerable people. You know, we talk about like, um, black home ownership, like, yeah, like if you're struggling and it's double mortgage, like, of course, people aren't buying homes. That's why we live in an apartment. Like I can't pay a double mortgage, you know, because of a tax. So I would say get rid of that, find creative ways to fund it. Um, in Illinois, where I am, obviously, I, I, you know, we have this an income tax, our sales tax is too high. But you know, we I think that probably the benefits of doing some type of consumption tax on certain goods to fund it would probably out uh, outweigh um, the cost of doing that, especially, you know, if you freed people up from property taxes, you then see people would have more money to have in other things. And so you give people these universal vouchers and you then let the market step in and do what it does with everything else. Um, you know, it, people think it's like such a complex thing. It's like, dude, so, 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 so is gro so is the grocery store. I mean, you got hundreds of moving parts, getting your food, into there thousands millions even you know when you talk about like the food production it, it, it happens and we get food at the lowest possible price and we have all these different options education can work the same way mm -hmm. you just you just need to to have faith in other people that they will figure it out well i don't know how to do it okay i don't i don't know how to run a grocery store doesn't mean i'm like want the government to like centrally plan it um so that that's that's my idea now people may say what about you know publicly funding it. Um, that's an area where we have to compromise because I, I haven't been able to think about how, you know, I do think the benefits of like education outweigh the cost of that type of public funding. Um, maybe not now, maybe now I think education is doing a pretty miserable job, but um, if we had this kind of system, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I think, you know, it's just like the lesser of two evils. Okay. We, we all pay a tax. You have two kids, you get X amount. But there's also benefits too. I mean, imagine too, I would say like a parent wants to homeschool. Right now, like in Illinois, I think like the average student spending is close to like 15 grand. Mm -hmm. So imagine a mother with three kids, that's $45,000 she can spend to stay at home. She fixes her childcare issue and she homeschools them. Mm -hmm. Now, the only argument I've heard against is like, well, what if people make bad decisions? It's like, there will be people that will make bad decisions. There will be some parents that will just say, yeah, I'll, um, I'll homeschool my kids. And I'm just going to sit on a couch watching TV all day and let them eat Cheetos. Like, but, but guess what? There, that happens. Like even the, the kids that go, those are the kids that aren't going to school. Those are the kids that are running around the streets or joining gangs or getting in all sorts of trouble. So with freedom and liberty, you, you have to put some trust in people and it's not always going to work out perfectly, but that's just the way it is. And we'll solve a lot more problems than we'll create. Yeah. If, if, if I, if I were to take, um, a kind of a, a skeptical lens to the education system. Um, you know, back when this country was founded, uh, education was never a federal, a federal government thing. Mm -hmm. so, so when we when we have such a centralized education system uh, that has a powerful monopoly that has literally, um, you know, power to decide whether a charter school can purchase their old property, can right. teach with them. You know, it's like Coke telling Pepsi that they can't have their old factory and just and mm -hmm. someone else. You know, there are so many barriers, right, to, to keep this uh, in power. Uh, we, uh, my last guest who, who, I'll, who I'll be posting um, soon, you know, we call it the Leviathan to go back to, you know, some biblical uh, references, right? So the Leviathan of government has its own interest in growing, right? So there, there, there is an inherent benefit to government, I think, to, to teach kids about this stuff, even though government, you know, would be the cause, the, the creator of the inequalities if, if they existed because of the various discriminations they, that they've created and done. So you create a class of, of people dependent on you and, and you see it with, with, with my generation, um, I don't know how old you are, but it's it, it's really what I started to see is we were learning you know moral relativism in schools, and we were uh, people were pitted against you know if if, if uh, I think my sister was in a class you know who's who's against abortion she's the only one that raised mm -hmm. her hand, and you know it, it's singling out people. We we live in a system that feeds itself, 
right? And and so my my kind of concern is that this is the tip of the iceberg. I, I think this war is, if you want to call it a culture war, um, we have to do some real convincing because the people in school today are going to be a lot more than the people that were educated before and may be like, hey, let's not make this, let's, let's all be, you know, they're, they're changing the paradigm of, of what, who, of the makeup of society from an ideological perspective. Kids can't even read. I was taught uh, phonics when I was three years old. I was always in an, an advanced reading. Like, I, you know, people, people can't read. Hearsay is heresy, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, so that, that, that's what makes me worried is, is how will these kids that are already, we're seeing results, I think, with, with smashing stores with skateboards and all that, is it something that they're just gonna grow out of? Or do you have any greater fears about where we're gonna be in 10 to 15 years? Yeah, I, I have a lot of really deeply rooted fears about where this goes partially based on on seeing how sometimes these things and it's there's no there's no formula but sometimes how these things have played out through history where one day people are saying come on we're prosperous this would never happen you know we have a strong traditional culture that promotes these values and the next minute students are executing their teachers or people are being put in camps i mean look I, I hope it never comes to that, but I think it would be naive to think that we're immune to that. And I think it would be irresponsible not to consider it and prepare and then try and do everything you can to prevent it. And, you know, I don't usually talk about this because, you know, I don't want to sound like a, you know, a nut job, but, you know, in, in 2020, I uh, bought a gun and ammunition and started building a supply kit, which it became really useful <laughs> during COVID actually, you know, storing up on some food because I worried about like, you know, a period of social instability where things were not business as usual. And, you know, I had a family then and I said, you know, what if people did come to my house? What if there was violence in the streets? What if I had to, you know, not that I want to be a part of that, but if, if I, you know, was trying to get my family to safety and it was me or them, like, can I protect them? And then from that came, I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't like this feeling. I don't like that. I have to like, you know, have locked up, you know, like this breaking case of emergency gun and these food supplies. I have to think about these things. I said, okay, so here I am as a teacher and I worry about kind of children being radicalized. What do I do? I said, well, I can be quiet. I can not say anything. I said, is there a risk in that? you know, compared to the risks of speaking out, obviously I knew, I said, is there a risk in being quiet? I said, okay, so what if this gets worse? Then, then maybe your job won't be so safe. Then maybe you won't be safe. Then maybe your family won't be safe. I said, okay, so that's probably a bigger risk. Maybe it's a one in 10 chance of happening, but I don't like those odds. Mm -hmm. Speaking out, well, at least I'm doing something. Okay. I'm doing something more constructive than being like, oh, I hope I never have to, you know, open this gun box and take out my food and try to flee with my family. Because I, I talked to people that, you know, this wasn't like, you know, someone might say, where, where did you get this? Or what did you talk to some like conspiracy theorists or some preppers? And no, it was actually um, Lily Tang Williams, who kind of first kind of woke me up to this. She grew up under uh, the cultural revolution in Maoist China and saw how very quickly, you know, people in her neighborhood went and went from being kind of like enemy classes under Mao. And then all of a sudden people are being executed and students are singing songs of the revolution, carrying villagers to the mountains to disappear. And I talked to some people from the former Soviet Union who shared similar concerns, talked about how quickly things can change. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I, I got to do something like I got to do something. And so I was said, okay, speaking out is risky, but it's not as risky as, as not doing anything. And I said, maybe I'll fail, but maybe I can at least get enough people's attention, be as loud as possible to just wake some people up, uh, specifically starting with our side, wake up our side, mm -hmm. education to what's going on. And then um, maybe we can stop this. Maybe we can put the brakes on it. I, I don't know. I, I And I don't have the, sometimes people look and ask me like, what's the answer? What's the solution? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just trying to trying to put the brakes on it, trying to draw attention to it. You know, you can't, uh, to, to first get 
us to where we can solve the problem. And I still have to work to convince people that there is a problem. And now I think a lot of people, you know, conservatives, you know, maybe the, you know, the half the country, they're starting to wake up to it. But now the challenge is to keep it at the forefront of all our issues, because it's a bedrock issue. It underlies every other, every other thing is, you know, the future voters are decided by what they're being taught in public schools. And so I said, Hey, you care about these issues. Don't, don't let in six months, this fall off the radar and you being back to worrying about other things, keep, you know, education as, as a, uh, the central issue to your, to your politics and keep it alive through 2024 and into 2030. And then maybe we have a chance. And if not, I, I did what I could, you know, that didn't always do it right. Mistakes I made, things I wish I phrased differently and said differently, but you know, um, at least I, I tried something. Right. And, and one of the things you, you just said sparked something else in, in my mind. Um, like 50, 50, 60 years ago, you know, you talk about being scared for, for up, you know, uproar or, or, or violence. Mm-hmm. People were leaving their doors open. People right. trusted people, people, you know, uh, there's a, a Sebastian Maniscalco skit in his, uh, or in his first comedy show, that's kind of popular. He's a great comedian. If you haven't heard him, um, he, where he talks about, you know, people just showed up the door, you know, ring the bell. We got cake. Oh, welcome. Like we got company. <laughs> that company. And now it's like, everyone get down, bear crawl, lights off, curtains closed. <laughs> no, one, no one, no one, uh, no one shows up. And, uh, one, one of my favorite authors is, is Thomas Sowell. Um, okay. Yeah. And I think one of his books, uh, discrimination disparities kind of probably touches a lot about these things, which is like, yes, discrimination exists. Um, but, it's not the contributing factor to all the, to all this. So, that, so that's how I try to even think through, through all this. I think, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's brilliant. And one of the stories that he brings up in one of his, his books is that there were two blackouts, major blackouts in New York city. Um, I forget the years, but they weren't that far apart, maybe 10 to 20 years. Mm-hmm. And the first, the earlier blackout, there was basically no crime during this blackout, okay. you know, people banded together. He's, he said, in, you know, in, in the public housing, people had their doors open, whoever had a TV, anyone could come in and they unified. Whenever it was 10, 15 years later, the second blackout, crime is nuts. So, so we're, you know, this isn't, this isn't a 30 year down the line impact, you know, like we're talking about, it's, it's, it can be seen pretty quickly. Um, yeah. the, 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 the devolution, so to speak, of how we act in society and, and, and how quickly we turn to violence where violence is speech, right? Yeah. Yeah. Things, things can, people underestimate how quickly things can go South. And I worry about that. Um, which is why I, I kind of think, you know, from, from a political perspective, um, sometimes people that have bad intentions that may do things to harm you or your family um, need to be kind of kept in place by kind of having the other side kind of consolidate and put their foot down and say, um, I just want you guys to, you know, you need to know we're, we're not going to take this and, and make them think twice about, you know, whatever it is they might do. I mean, I've, I've heard speech, I've heard speech normalized. Um, even among teachers where they've said things, you know, comments about locking people up or, you know, and sometimes they're saying it in jest, you know, getting rid of people. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, they, they do all this alarmist talk like, oh, the, the right's fascist and stuff, but they talk about, you know, you know, you should just arrest all the tremors and throw them all in jail and no try They're terror. You know, now they're calling, you know, they're terrorists, they're insurrectionists, they're this and that, you know, uh, I don't know. It's, it's not far to go from that to like something worse. Or even if you, if you feel that, if you hate the other side so much, you might be willing to overlook it. You know, if conservatives are racist, fascists, and I don't know, someone did propose something, you might say, well, I'm not going to say anything against it. I, I don't, I don't think at like this point that'll, you know, I think that it would it would create such a mess. I do think there, there there would be enough people standing against it, but it doesn't mean that things can't get bad. And um, I think we are part of a moment too. I just hope we can keep up the energy where people are starting to press that, you know, say like, you know what? No, I'm not going to be scared anymore of speaking out. I'm going to, you're seeing more and more people come out and do that. 
and resist cancel culture. So maybe there is some, some reason to be optimistic. It, for me, it's just a question of how far is the left going to push and how much are they going to tolerate? Are they going to back down a little when they see people resist or are they going to go full force? Um, and then what underlying um, other things come, come into play, like you know, what other kind of economic conditions exist at the time. Um, but that's why education worries me too, because I, I, I think to myself, like, gosh, if this becomes the predominant ideology, if we don't win this and this is what children are learning, we might get into a situation where one day, you know, we're literally outnumbered by people that just have completely different value that values that came from kind of uh, what were once these esoteric kind of philosophies and now are kind of mainstream trickling down from higher education into public education and to children. And then, then you look around and you're like, wow, the population's changed because of how they've been educated. So that's, that's the risk too. Yeah. I, I think, I think, I think fascism is a, is a big concern. Um, mm -hmm. I think from the left and right, um, uh, if, if, if talking from my perspective, we largely live in a fascist society mm -hmm. um, because I mean, federal government and Tesla, federal government and Google, we have the government or Amazon, we have the government propping up businesses, working with them in kind, small businesses get crushed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, if you talk about um, the minimum wage, um, where, you know, Amazon loves the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and why, why does the minimum wage need to go from seven to $20? Why has the standard of living gone so bad? Uh, because of, of the government's or the, the Federal Reserve, which is as federal as Federal Express, prints money. So it creates these societal problems that we see now. The, the Black family was experiencing so much prosperity and, and gains back mm -hmm. basically up until uh, I think, I think the, you know, the, the great society or the, uh, LBJ programs, when the minimum, when the minimum wage was instituted, it harmed disproportionately, um, black teens. Mm -hmm. so, so the government has, you know, through its monetary system created such great inequalities, um, that where this is where the war is, is like convalescing, you know, it's kind of like you move a bubble, an economic bubble from let's say com to housing to et cetera you move your, your, your other societal problems from like, oh, this, this is the big thing. Oh, now it's there. Now it's in schools. And this is like right. almost the final frontier of whether we want big government, centralized control, teaching us to hate each other um, and versus, versus freedom. Yeah. And, and we need to start standing up because like, look, a lot of these things have happened because we've let them happen. And I would say, especially, like, I know people think that the right is all like, there are a lot of noise, but they, but they let a lot of things happen. I think the reason Trump was so popular, regardless of what anyone thinks about him is because he, the way he stood up to it in a way that people just hadn't seen people were like, oh, I don't agree with all his policies, but damn, it felt good to see someone be like, no, like, I, I just don't care. Like you're not doing that, or you're not going to say that, or I don't care if you do say it. And, and that's kind of, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not a Trumpian, but like in that sense, but I, I think my approach is going to kind of like, yeah, I, I'm going to say it. I don't care. I'm standing up to it. I think, the the right and libertarians like we, you can't just like we, we've been like well let's let's debate it while they're just marching over us i'm like no sometimes we have to stand up i mean the left is great at that the left make you know they, they scare people they go out and they protest in numbers and rightly or wrongly you know the other side doesn't do that and so there's no like fear of them they get on like you know pundit shows and and rant or you know i <laughs> I, what do, what do we, what do we do when we're upset? Recently you've started seeing, you know, parents going to school board meetings and show up, but that's, that's relatively new. So maybe there's some hope, but like, it, they're just going to, you know, this you can't let people will treat you how you let them treat you. And I think that's, that's the, the, the thing. And the problem is that conservatives are natural by nature. They are conservative. They don't want to, uh, you know, get into these kind they want to kind of do their job, stay at home, focus on their family. That's why they're political conservatives is obviously because they're, you know, social and cultural conservatives. It just, you know, it, it put everyone on their heels. Um, and so maybe this is a start, maybe by, you know, first starting to kind of assert our right to speak, and we're going to say these things, and we're going to disagree. And maybe we need to kind of mobilize. I'm seeing, you know, grassroots kind of uh, movement on, on some levels. The right doesn't have that. The left is grass. They are great with grassroots. Like, you know, they get community organizing down to a science and have all these little groups pop up. And the right, it's always very like, oh, we have our think tanks and, you know, this and that. But we don't have 
you know, um, I'm not saying like fear them in a bad way, but I'm saying there should be some kind of, you know, the way, the way school boards have been like, oh gosh, we, we don't want Black Lives Matter showing up and like protesting the news out there. They should feel the same way about conservative parents. They should be like having like basically what's cartoon child porn in schools and being like, oh, what are these parents going to do there? Well, maybe if like they were a little more scared of like, kind of like a, a protest or something, if we got better at doing that, they might think twice about that. So that goes back to what I was saying is there has to be some kind of um, respect for our power too, as much as we, we respect and fear their power, because in some ways we, we, you know, people's reaction to like, I don't want to get canceled. And you hear, I still have like conservative friends, you know, and they're very outspoken, like privately, but they're like, I can't lose my, job. so it's like, so, so you are afraid and you do recognize their power and you know, there's consequences. Well, a little balance in that would help because it would at least allow us to maybe, I don't know, comp you know, you can't compromise unless the, um, you start from kind of close to even positions. Otherwise it's just, it's, it's the other side just going to tell you exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. Like you can't compromise with your boss when he can like, fight, you know, here there's, there's no thing as a compromise. It's yes, sir. No, sir. Yep. Now, if you are, you know, um, on more equal footing with your boss, then you can compromise. And so that, that's what this is about. People just don't understand it. I think the dynamics of power and how it works and, and what you need to, um, to get to that point where you can do that. Um, right. Yeah. I think tanks are good. If when, when, when you have a population that thinks for themselves, <laughs> right. um, I think, I think largely they're now just, you know, Hey, lobbyist, you know, do this, do this lobby your congressman. Right. Um, but uh, one, one of the things you mentioned was going to the school boards. Does, does that do anything like at all? Is it helpful? I, I think so. curriculum? Yeah. I, well, look, so a lot of times it's a rubber stamp. I think what it does is it shows them that parents are paying attention. Uh, you have to be accountable to us. We will make some noise. We will make, you know, sometimes to get things done, you have to make people's lives difficult. People respond to either incentives or consequences. And if there's no incentive for them to listen to you, um, they're like my school district, there's zero incentive for them to listen to me. They don't care. I had to make it painful for them to ignore me, you know, and I had to make it painful. Also, I think one of the reasons I haven't been fired yet is because I tried to quickly put myself in a position where it might be more painful to fire me than to keep me. Um, because, you know, I'll go on the radio or TV, I'll get all this attention. It was, you know, it was calculated in that sense. And I, I know it's weird to think about, but that's how I thought about it. I'm like, okay. So sometimes when you make things painful for people, they're forced to listen and to sit down with you. Um, and the left is right on that regards. Like when they talk about like protests and stuff, like their protests make things painful and they do force people to listen. I'm not saying the, the, the where I draw the line is like using like violence and, and so forth. That's where, you know, they're okay with that. Like, we'll make it painful for people, you know, burn down their businesses. No, 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 no. But you can make your presence known and, and you can be a little disruptive and you can, uh, you know, use civil disobedience if you have to. And we have to, you know, I mean, we've paid it to, I think this country has paid an enormous amount of attention to the, you know, when the left brings these things up, we've seen a lot of change and not all of it's been bad. Some of these things are like, okay, we should pay attention to some of these issues with police. My problem is just, they, it's like, they never know when to stop. It's like, they, they just keep protesting and keep pushing it further. And it's, and yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so a couple of the last, one of the last things I want to touch on is, is, is social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I've seen kind of snippets of that in, in curriculum, let's say for, for, for pre-K or, or whatever it is. Um, because obviously, you know, maybe someone that's four years old, five years old, you know, they may not be teaching, you know, the Chinese exclusion act or, or whatever to these, to these kids. So how early does it start? Um, and, and does social, what is social emotional learning? Um, and, and how might it also relate to this ideology? Um, you have any insight on that how are yeah how, how early does it start i'm not sure i'm kind of looking into see um like in, in my son's school he started kindergarten i'm kind of trying to see how it manifests i'm, I'm not sure what to think i think well i think there's two ways it, it, it comes into play i think there's the on the, on the one side it's, it's largely benign but it's like drugstore psychology it's just like okay great and and not all the things are bad i, I kind of like seeing that with little kids like teaching them like you know proper etiquette and how to respond to people and how to deal with conflict i mean that's all great my problem with it is it's operated sort of like a trojan horse in that 
it's so vague and undefined. It can become kind of whatever you want it to be. And, and guess what? They're, they're, I found examples where they're just starting to put social justice into social emotional learning, call it social emotional learning, claim it's backed on science and they can do whatever they want with it. And that's where I have a problem with it. True, whatever true social and emotional learning is, um, and, and I would imagine it's just teaching children how to like manage their behaviors and their emotions, common sense stuff. I don't think anyone would have a problem with that. I think it's, you have a problem when you look at like social and emotional learning curriculums and they start to then talk about like social justice as a component. You're like, whoa, wait a second. Like this isn't, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I said when I supported like teaching children how to socialize property properly or, um, or they start teaching. I'm trying to think of another example. I, I made a poem. I found a lot of stuff from my like district that put up stuff. And there's a big component of social justice in it. So it's it's been tainted now. And 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 this is again, this is schools and teachers have abused the trust they've been given. So they have no one to blame for the, but themselves. So if they're like, well, well, now we can't teach children how to socially and emotionally learn. Um, yeah, maybe you can't now because you blew it because you were given that opportunity to do that. And you decided to package social justice curriculum into it. And now people don't trust you and you've made the word toxic. So that's your fault. So get back to teaching, reading and writing, try yeah. it again in 10 years, and then maybe try and actually do an authentic uh, social and emotional learning curriculum uh, with like real psychologists, you know, school psychologists consulting, not, you know, consultants in these prepackaged curriculums. So it's like, it's like they blew it. They're, they're now, you know, a lot of teachers like, oh, so now we can't talk about race in school. Well, guess what? You abuse that trust. So you're right. Now, now you're going to have a harder time talking about it because you took the trust the public gave you and you abused it, manipulated it for your political ends. And now people are hypersensitive. So that sucks for you. Like, what do you expect? Um, you blew it. You abuse people's trust. So, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I would, uh, I would love if they taught, you know, Marsh, Marshall Rosenberg, he wrote um, Nonviolent Communication. That mm, would be, okay. That'd be a great starting point. For yeah, teaching. there's, there's some great, there's some great things, I think, in, in teaching, like, you know, children how to respond and, and not to use conflict, how to respond to conflict, conflict's normal. Um, how to respond to violence. Um, you know, I'm dealing with a little five-year-old who still sometimes throws tantrums and wants to swing his arms and hit. And it's hard. And sometimes I, I, I like to see the school, like, you know, maybe help them with that. Cause I'm, I'm a high school teacher. I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm not an expert on little kids. And sometimes, especially with your first child, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And you're like, I'm probably just screwing him up, man. Like, you know, I'm like, but, um, so yeah, so again, kernels of truth and there's things that I'd like to see, but man, I wish they would just stop like, stop trying to insert their political agenda and everything and poison it. I mean, I don't know. They accuse the, the, the right of doing that, but I, you know, school, religion in schools, for example, like despite all the, like, you know, we used to hear about that all the time in college. They're like, oh yeah, we, you know, talk like, like there was this common thing. It, it's not, it's like teachers know, especially conservative teachers know, it's like, you can't do that. And you have to be very careful. But the other side in their politics, it's like, I'm just going to do it. Like, so mm -hmm. they, they've abused the trust. They, they, uh, T we, I should say we, um, even for me, you know, I, I think part of what I did too, I think I, you know, felt some kind of guilt for a while. Um, just going along with things, just mm -hmm keeping my mouth shut, going in, collecting a paycheck, feeling demoralized, um, you know, feeling sometimes like I like, guys, I'm not a good teacher anymore. What happened to me? Um, that was hard feeling like I just got beat down. And I'm like, I don't like, I didn't like who I'd become. Like, this isn't me. This isn't why I went in education and the advice I was getting. Um, I understand people like, you know, some of my, my, my friends or colleagues, they, they want to protect me. And they're like, Hey, just come in, man. Don't make a scene. Don't point out anything wrong. It's a good gig. Collect your paycheck. Go home. Don't even have to work that hard. And, mm. and that's true. But that comes at a, that comes at a real cost to your integrity and your just the core of who you are. And um, yep, it sucks. Yeah. If I if I may make a personal comment, sure. so, so so you know if you were speaking out, I I think. You know, and, and you have this integrity, I'd say your parents probably did a pretty good job. Um, <laughs> so I think 
I think, uh, you know, you, you probably won't have too much to worry about with your, with your son. Cause you know, he can see his father has integrity. So oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, if the, the, the biggest challenge is he's probably going to be a, a rebel like me and like, you know, he's already got, he challenges everything, but you know what? Maybe that's, maybe that's good. I, I did that too. I, ch I challenged everything. I good made my life karma. so difficult. <laughs> yeah. I made my life so difficult for my parents. I pushed back. I questioned everything. I was not a cooperative child, but, um, but you need, you need some unsettlers and some people that, that kind of shake up things uh, from time to time. Not too many, but a small percentage yeah. of the population to, you know, get, get, I, I've learned that, you know, everyone can't be like me and I would not want everyone to be like me, you know, and I, there's places someone said, you know, like yesterday, they're like, well, what about, you know, reaching the middle? I said, look, I'm not, the, I'm not that guy probably. Like actually in a conversation and dialogue, but I'm like right now, like what I'm doing, that's not my function. And, and then there's other people for that. But, I, but my point was, I said, hey, look, the fact that we're having this conversation is because I made a lot of noise. So like, here we are. So now, now you go do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, me? Like, yeah. Like I, I, I blew things up with fireworks. And like, you know, uh, got some people to engage in these discussions, got some people to pay attention and we've had some discussions. Okay. If you, maybe you can do it better than me. I'll admit that. Maybe that's not my strength. Maybe I'm too, you know, too explosive. Uh, I'll keep trying to get people to pay attention. I'll keep trying to, and then maybe some of those people can say, oh, I don't, you know, uh, people, I, I like him. He got, he got my attention. I think it's fun to follow him, but I'm going to go try going to my school board a little bit more. Yeah. You know, that, that's just my philosophy. Maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I won't be successful at it, but I, I just think sometimes like you have to have the people that just make a lot of noise and then they get attention. And then, you know, the real groundwork is going to be done by probably, you know, not by me, but by, uh, anyone that, listens to me and all these other teachers they're starting to come forward i'm hoping we can kind of keep this momentum up keep building and um support each other and maybe good things will happen i hope um mm -hmm. yeah L last question before we can uh, sure. close out if that's all right so you know how uh after every you know debate let's say presidential or whatever you know yeah uh -huh. donald trump you know they ask or hillary and, uh, and and donald trump what is uh you know, they ask him, what, what's one thing that you really admire about your opponent or, or, or whatnot? So I would like to ask you, um, has any good, do you think, come out of their efforts to, to teach some of this stuff? Like, you know, let's say, you know, kids more, kids are more, maybe are more aware of that people suffer um, and that they don't need to live in a bubble. Is there anything good that has come out of this that we can take forward, even if we, e even if this fight is won against necessarily teaching um, the, the tenets or pedagogy of, of critical race theory. Is there any good that's come out of it in your opinion? Yeah. Um, I would say that, that one positive thing, uh, that I I'm a big believer in like personal and self-reflection. And I do think they, they incorporate an element of that. I may not agree with it, but they ask people, you know, and unfortunately it's usually like white people reflect on your privilege and power, but like, sometimes you should reflect on like your circumstances and you should reflect on how other people live. And just do it without the, you know, the kind of um, collective lens and the kind of antagonistic lens. I don't think it's inherently bad to sometimes like look at people and be like, yeah, I can get that. I can see why that would be hard. I can see there are probably people that like, um, you know, if someone talks to me on a personal level and says like, oh, I felt judged by this community and stuff, like get that, empathize with them, talk about it. I just don't like the way it gets extrapolated into these larger narratives and it starts blaming people. Um, and again, I'll go back to the example, like my wife, where she grew, down, or grew, grew up and uh, coming here, she has definitely experienced like a degree of marginalization and, and comments people have made, you know, that are very class-based. I mean, sometimes like, what, why don't you go to college? Are you not smart enough? Like people that actually say that to her and like, you know, hurtful things. And, um, but, but, it's never been, it's like, you listen to that and you talk about that and you, you try and focus on well, that's not all people. And, um, she could have very easily gone a negative way with it and had like this class resentment. And I hate these people, but she doesn't, she's like, yeah, there's some people like that in this town. Most time, most are good. And you, and you try to connect with them on a personal level. And then, uh, that's what I tell my students too. Um, it's very easy to remember, like, you know, the one white person that said something negative to you but you, you know our, our brains naturally forget the other 10 examples where that didn't happen so sometimes you know i think maybe this is an example a way we can kind of promote racial healing is have those conversations a student tells you that listen to them 
That was, that was horrible. I understand that. But also help, you know, kind of do some cognitive processing with them. Are all people like that? No. Can you think of two times when maybe a white person did something that surprised you? And so, oh, yeah. Well, the, these two instead, they really, you know, changed my perception. Okay. How do we incorporate that into our understanding? Like, that's good. Like, that's like good, like cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm not an expert on it, but that's, you know, I've done some myself. There's like ways of like working these things in and processing them. And I think maybe we just need an alternative. I know like uh, Chloe Valdery is like doing like her own kind of version of like working with like, she calls enchantment. it enchantment yeah. and, and this idea. And she focuses on like white students too, who have been like, she talks about like preventing kind of like white identitarianism um, by focusing on. Um, the real kind of disillusionment and disconnection many young white people may feel like, well, who am I now? If I am this racial group that you're pointing out, where's my place? And am I a bad guy? I don't want to be that. And so she's like trying to connect people to the healthy identities. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but. Yeah. Um, I think that's it, Peterson's place in as well for, for a lot of maybe disaffected men. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Finding ways to, you know, it's not that that men are toxic or that masculinity is toxic. It's finding ways to build it healthily and um, not hate yourself because of it. You're not an oppressor because, you know, it, there's, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I like Jordan Peterson a lot. He's, he's uh, definitely has a very, I think, inspirational, positive way of kind of like looking at things that's balanced and fair and helps you kind of constructively do something better. Um, you know, I don't know why he's been so controversial. It's <laughs> yeah, he's a. I, whenever I read his books, I kind of read it in his voice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I love his voice. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. wish I could do it. Like, no, yeah. no, that's, I can't even do it. Yeah, but yeah. He has this just this unique kind of voice and and way he speaks. And uh, no, he's he's a good guy. I'd, I'd love to be able to speak to him one day. But... He's the Matthew McConaughey of, of psychologists. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, So so uh, just wrapping up, where can where can people follow you, um, and how can they how can they help you um, in any way? Yeah, you know, at this point, I'm just like just just come follow me. Uh, I'll, I'll respond to your DMs, engage with me. I'm just you know trying to build a community, and and I I like working with people and talking to people, so. Uh, if they go to Twitter, that's where I'm like most active. Uh, C B as in boy, heresy, H E R E S Y, um, www.chalkboardheresy.com. I admit I I've been haven't been as active on there, but I do have some blog posts, and you know people may find them interesting. Um, I'm also going to be doing some writing at uh, Chalkboard Review, which is also on Twitter, and uh, they have a website. And so I would just say uh, follow teachers like us engage with us, ask questions. Um, sometimes, I mean, really, it sounds silly, but like, you know, when you retweet like a teacher and teachers get excited, it's like a way of just being like, you're kind of amplifying their voice and standing behind them. And sometimes you can make a difference. You know, maybe what we need to do is when teachers are automatically canceled, maybe we need to start what the left does, call the school districts, make it, make it painful for them to just fire someone because they did something we disagree with, like wore a MAGA hat or, I mean, who knows, or said they don't agree with Black Lives Matter or the political movement. I mean, my God, like, you know, it's just crazy. Um, so maybe that's that's how we can support teachers and, and just being active and, and coming to the, their defense. And I'm, I'll try to do that for other teachers too. And I'll try and do that for students and parents. Um, you know, when we need a community, when, when they come after us, we, you know, hold the shields up and say, you're not going to do that. And if you're going to try, we're going to make it uncomfortable for you you know maybe we will show up and protest at your school board I mean get the media there and have some tough questions for you because they've they've done everything through kind of subterfuge the schools like to do things quietly and without much attention they like to pull people into back rooms get them gone resign and move on and we just got we got to stop that yep um frank this has been a, a great conversation um really i was really excited to uh to talk to you um and get your Thanks. perspective Thanks. um so uh frank mccormick chalkboard heresy go follow him um thank you for joining this episode of the opposing points podcast thanks for having me i really appreciate it, it was a lot of fun thanks